This week, I'll show you the basics of flash photography. I've owned and used many flash units over the years, from the really expensive Canon strobes right through to the Pro Photo units. I now use the cheaper third party Yonguno flashes. I have three of them. I have remotes for them and they work really well. One thing I've found is with these cheaper third party units, I do have to change the batteries a little bit more often, but for doing small corporate head shoots, they work perfectly. I can fit all of the flashes and cameras into one bag and the stands and soft boxes into a tripod bag, giving me a very portable flash photography setup. But in saying all this, you do need to know how a single flash will affect your photo and how changing the settings will affect the flash in that photo. A flash unit, also known as a strobe, helps to put more light on your subject. When done properly, you can decrease your ISO, increase your shutter speed, giving you a much cleaner image. A flash fires quickly, and I mean really quickly. And when you see flashes filmed, sometimes you'll see part of the frame as normal, and then part of the frame overexposed with that flash. This just shows that the flash is faster than a readout of a single frame. This doesn't happen on cameras with global shutters, but I'm talking about videos that read from top to bottom. Even though there are TTL or through the lens modes on your flash or some automatic modes, I'm gonna show you how to shoot in manual mode. When you understand how the flash works in conjunction with shutter speed and aperture, you can gain control of everything and you can control the shot and make it look exactly how you want. Now, there are a few things that you need to understand when shooting with flash units. And the first one is sync speed. Sync speed refers to the fastest shutter speed you can have in your camera when the sensor is exposed as a whole in one go. So basically the way a shutter works is that you have one shutter that exposes the sensor to light and another one that covers it up. These may be mechanical or electronic. At certain shutter speeds, the rear shutter will start to close before the front curtain has finished opening. And this is why if you go over a certain shutter speed, you'll start to get part of the shot really dark and the other part exposed for the flash. In these examples, I took this first one below the sync speed, the second one at the sync speed, and the third one over the sync speed. I did take a fourth one as well that was twice the sync speed. So you can see the faster your shutter is than the sync speed, the more of the shot that will be obscured by the shutter from the flash. When you start to see these black strips in your shots, the flash has basically fired and only been exposed to part of the sensor as the shutter mechanism is covering the darker part of the shot. So the shutter sync speed just means the fastest shutter speed that the camera has, the whole of the sensor exposed in one moment. Enough for a flash to be fired and not to be obscured. Now it does seem a little bit counterintuitive because you think that the faster the shutter speed, the more likely the flash is to fill that shorter exposure time. But due to the way that the shutter works, it limits the fastest shutter speed that you can use, which then is actually a lot slower than the duration of the flash. Now there is a function called high speed sync, and this enables you to shoot with much faster shutter speeds. But this is a subject for another video. Now there are a couple of ways you can find the sync speed for your camera. One is to Google it, and the other one is to take the same test shots as I just have. So you'd fire it maybe at 1 100th of a second, 1 150th of a second, 1 180th of a second, 1 200th of a second, and 1 250th of a second, and maybe 1 3 20th of a second. Once you start seeing the black strip, you know that you've gone over the sync speed for your camera. So then just take it back to the shutter speed where you don't see any of this black strip. Just make a note of this shutter speed and then don't ever take the shutter speed faster than this. So I have a few rules I stick to when using a flash. And if you think of your settings like this, you'll be able to really control the flash and ambient light in your camera and in your photographs. You basically break your light into ambient light and flashlight. Now you may want to cut out most of the ambient light. You may want a mixture of the two, or you may just want to use the flash just to fill the shadows slightly. For any of these scenarios, I always think of my settings in the following way. Your shutter speed is much slower than the duration of the flash. So think of it as just controlling your ambient light. This is because no matter how slow or fast the shutter speed is, 
up to the sync speed of course, it won't be as fast as the flash. So whenever the shutter is open, it'll take in all of the flashlight. But the longer you leave your exposure, the more ambient light you'll let into the camera. Your ISO and aperture control both flash and ambient light. This is because with aperture, you're increasing or decreasing the size of the hole that the light can get through. And with ISO, you're changing the application of the signal from the sensor. So these control the overall exposure of your photograph. And then we have the flash power setting. This comes in fractions, one over one being full power, one over two being half power, one over four being quarter power, and so on and so forth, right down to one 128th. The lower the power, the longer the batteries will last in your flash and also the quicker the recycle time. One other thing to take into consideration is that for each fraction change that you make in the power on the flash, this changes the flash brightness by one stop. So one quarter to one half would be the same as f5.6 to f4, or ISO 100 to ISO 200. And one quarter to one eighth on the flash would be the same as f5.6 to f8, or ISO 100 to ISO 50. Now you might be wondering why I haven't included shutter speed. And the reason for this is that really short duration of the flash. No matter how long or short the shutter speed is, as long as you're below the sync speed, it'll take in all of the power of the flash. So it doesn't matter what shutter speed you're at, the flash power will be exactly the same. And for now, this is all you need to know about your flash. You can have it in manual mode, and you're gonna change the fraction of power that you're gonna use. So as long as you understand stops of light and you know how aperture, shutter speed and ISO work together, this fractional change should seem quite familiar. If you want to learn more about aperture, shutter speed or ISO, click on the eye in the corner. This will take you to another of my tutorials. One other thing to take into consideration is the flash duration especially if you have things moving fast through your frame. The closer to full power that you are on your flash unit, the longer the duration of the flash. So if something's moving fast through your shot, it's more likely to blur. In this highly sophisticated test, I take the first shot at full power and the second at 1 64th of the power. The first is blurred and the second isn't. So the lower the power, the shorter the duration of the flash. Don't worry too much about this for now. Just know that if your subject starts blurring due to motion when you're using a flash, you may have to reduce the power, which will reduce the duration of the flash, more likely freezing your subject. And do remember to increase your aperture or ISO to compensate for this decrease in flash power. Most flashes do have a zoom function. They tend to go from about 24 millimeters right through to around about 100 to 105 millimeters. All this is doing is widening or focusing that light with the Fresnel head built onto the front. You don't have to worry too much about this for now. Just make sure that the zoom follows what zoom you're using on your camera. So say if you're shooting with a 24 millimeter lens, make sure it's at 24 millimeters. If you're shooting at 70, make sure the zoom on the flash is at 70. So in knowing this, I start off with the following settings. I put the shutter speed at around about 1 100th of a second, my ISO at 100, aperture at f5.6, and I set the flash to manual and one quarter of the power. I set my white balance to flash. If you're using a mirrorless camera, you'll have to turn live view display off to see what you're shooting. Once you've done this, Take a test shot. One quick tip to get much better light from your flash instantly is to tip the head of the light up towards the ceiling. As long as you've got a white ceiling, it'll give you a really nice light. This will bounce the flash off the ceiling, making the flash a much bigger light source and making the light a lot softer. It will dissipate the intensity, so you may have to increase the flash power if needed. Then you want to play around with your shutter speed and flash power to get the right ratio between the two sources of light. Once you've got this, you can adjust your aperture to get a good overall exposure. And this is where personal taste comes into play. You might like more flash, or you may prefer more ambient light, but knowing how to change each light source is critical to get what you want. If I want more ambient light, I'll lower my shutter speed. If I want less ambient light, I'll increase my shutter speed. 
You just need to make sure when increasing your shutter speed, you don't go faster than the sync speed. If I want just the flash to be brighter, I'll increase the flash power. If I want the flash to be darker, I'll decrease its power. So very quickly, you can dial in your settings by just thinking of shutter speed for ambient light and flash power for flash. So I've taken a sequence of self-portraits, changing the settings so you can see what I mean. When I change the shutter speed, the flash amount doesn't change as it fires off much faster than the shutter speed I've set. So whether I'm shooting at 1 25th of a second or 1 200th of a second, it doesn't matter. The flash power stays the same. When I change the aperture, you can see it changes the intensity of the flash. This just changes the size of the aperture, which changes the amount of that flash coming into your camera. Now, if I do the same shot, but with some ambient light in the frame, look how the ambient light reduces as the shutter speed increases, but the flash intensity stays the same. When I change just the aperture, you can see the flash changes as well as the ambient light. Next, I keep the aperture and the shutter speed the same and then change the power intensity of the flash. Obviously, the closer to full power that you get, the more overexposed the shot will become. I try to keep my ISO to 100 and when you're using a flash, this is pretty easy to do because there's lots of light about. And obviously, the lower the ISO, the less noise in your photographs. So when dialing in my settings, if I want there to be very little ambient light and all flashlight, I'll have my shutter speed set at the max sync speed, which on the a7 III is 1 200th of a second. And then I'll increase the power of the flash and then control the overall exposure with aperture. You can see in this shot, the lamp on the left side has been completely overpowered by the flash and it looks quite dark outside. If I want to blend ambient and flashlight, what I'll do is I'll decrease my shutter speed and then play around with both shutter speed and aperture. If I then need to increase or decrease the flash compared to the ambient light, what I'll do is change the power on the flash. Now you can see the light from the lamp on the left hand side and the sunlight is more balanced with the flashlight. All I need to do now is change my aperture to change my overall exposure because I've balanced the ambient light outside and the flashlight inside together to where I want them to be. It does take a while to get your head around this, but once you do, you'll be able to dial in those settings really quickly and then you'll have ultimate control over your flash and ambient light. You'll also be able to get really consistent results that you wouldn't do in maybe an auto mode or TTL mode. Now, this is just an introduction to flash photography, but if you understand these basic principles, you'll be well on your way to getting good photos with flashes. The next thing to think about is how you use the flash head to disperse that light. If you have it pointing directly at your subject, it'll be a really harsh, hard light because that light source is really small. If you have one of these flash units with a movable head, what you wanna try and do is bounce it off different surfaces in the room that you're in. As long as the surfaces aren't black, they will bounce that light back and they'll normally create a much bigger light source. So in using the basic principles that I've just taught you, try tilting the head of the flash towards a big wall or a big ceiling just to see how the light changes. You can grab a family member and use them as a subject or if you have a remote shutter, you can take photos of yourself. This is direct flashlight. This is bounced off the ceiling. This is bounced off the left wall and this is bounced off the right hand wall. So you can see even with the flash on the camera, you can find big white surfaces or big surfaces that you can bounce the flash off and get much better, softer light. Now these are just the basics, but there are many more aspects to flash photography. For instance, you can bounce the lights like I've just shown you. You can use soft boxes, you can use umbrellas, you can use really big soft boxes. Then if you have a remote system of firing the flash off camera, you can start angling the flash compared to the angle that you're shooting at. And as well as all of this, you can start using multiple flash heads in a single shot. So there is so much to learn and that's about it. Like I always say, you just need to go out and take photographs with your camera and with your flash to really understand the basic principles of it. If you have to, re-watch the video to really understand these basic fundamentals. 
and before long, you'll be using your Flash in really creative ways. So over the next few months, I'm gonna make more tutorials on Flash photography as it's such a big subject. If you are into Flash photography or there's something I missed, leave a comment below. It'll be great to hear your thoughts and it'll be great to hear how you get on with flashes in your photography. As always, if you like what you see, give me a thumbs up. If you didn't, give me a thumbs down. And for weekly tutorials, hints and tips in photography and videography, subscribe and turn on notifications. I'll see you in the next one.